funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. I'm Paul Wright and you're listening to the second programme of Greening the White House. The seven-part series which explores the island of Ireland ancestry of various US presidents, with a key focus on the ancestral homesteads and locations linked to them in Ireland. In our last programme we investigated the County Antrim roots of the seventh US president, Andrew Jackson. In this programme the spotlight falls first on the eleventh US president, James Knox Polk, who served in high office from 1845 to 1849. In and around the 1670s, James Knox Polk's ancestors left the Lifford area of County Donegal to establish a new life in America. Historian and genealogist Brian Mitchell of the Tower Museum in Derry City. The Ulster connection is that his great 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 grandfather was Robert Bruce Pollock. It was in the, it was in America that the name was abbreviated from Pollock to Polk, you know, P O L K. Now Robert Bruce Pollock was a a soldier adventurer under you know in Cromwell's army. He ended up in the Lifford area because he married into the Tasker family of Clonlee, which is the parish that Lifford is in. So, I mean, there were considerable landholders, and I think Cavanacore House, which stands to this day, would have been sort of in the centre of their property near the village of Ballandrate, would have been the ancestral home. And staying with Cavanacore House, here's the story in Eddie O'Kane of Cavanacore House to explain President Pollock's ancestral link to Magdalene Tasker and her family's home, Cavanacore House which was built by our father, Roger Tasker, in the early 1600s. The link between the president comes about through the uh, Tasker family originally. Uh, So Roger Tasker had uh, two daughters. The eldest daughter was Barbara Tasker and her younger sister was Magdalene Tasker. Now Magdalene Tasker married an officer in the army called uh, Captain Porter. And he died, and then she married another officer from his regiment, and he was uh, Robert Bruce Pollock. So the house was given to the elder daughter, Barbara, as part of her marriage portion when she married a man called John Keyes. And uh, the younger sister, as I said, married uh, Robert Bruce Pollock, and they eventually emigrated in the late 1600s to uh, America to the Chesapeake Bay and then they settled in Maryland and uh, her descendant several generations later was the President of America James Knox Polk. And at this juncture Eddie O'Kane quoted from the famous genealogical publication Burke's Peerage and Baronetage in which it details the evidential trail linking Cavanagh House and Magdalene Pollock Knee Tasker the third great grandmother of President Polk. John Keyes married Barbara, daughter and heiress of Roger Tasker, to whom her father assigned Kevin Accor, which estate henceforth became their principal residence. And then you have the lineage of the Keyes going down from there. And Eddie, just the key phrase in that document, the archival document, Burke's Peerage and Baronetage, what's it again? What's the line again, that key line? That so the key line there is uh, John Keyes married Barbara, daughter and heiress of Roger Tasker, to whom her father assigned Cabinet Corps, which uh, states henceforth became their principal residence. So that refers to uh, Roger Tasker's ownership of Cabinet Corps and his handing over the uh, property as a marriage portion to uh, Barbara. And Barbara, as we know, was the elder sister of Magdalene. In other words, Magdalene Tasker, the third great-grandmother of the 11th US President James Knox Polk, would have grown up, along with her elder sister Barbara, in Cavanagh Corps House, situated in Lifford, County Donegal. Kieran Fagan, manager of Monray Heritage Centre in East County Donegal. President James Polk, his ancestral home is Cavanagh Core House and uh, that still stands to the present day. It's been continuous occupation. I mean, they're still occupied to this day, standing from the 1600s, a fine residence, by the way. And it's worth noting that both Magdalene and Robert Bruce Pollock were of Ulster Scott stock. 
being descended from Scottish people who migrated to Ulster during the 17th century. So what kind of a life might the Pollocks have lived in Lifford before they eventually emigrated to America, where they changed their surname to Polk, Brian Mitchell? I suspect that they would have been big farmers. I don't know whether you would have called them a landowner. I mean, most, as, as everybody in Ireland at that time period, depended on farming to a greater or lesser extent. So I suspect they had a, a medium-sized farm. Uh, now, I imagine they probably sublet property on that farm. So I suspect they earned, for the time, a good enough living as, you know, farming. But I do think, and in many cases, the Ulster Scots just looked on, uh, this, just, this isn't big enough for us. We, want, we think there's other opportunities there. And they were open to moving on. Sometime in around the year 1680, the Pollocks left their home in County Donegal and boarded a ship from the port of Derry, bound for a new life in North America. Dr William Rolston of the Ulster Historical Foundation. Certainly Donegal features very strongly in the emigration story. I suppose you could say it's proximity to the port of Derry, which was becoming very much part of that transatlantic trading network connecting colonial America with Ireland, with Scotland, with England as well. And and the port of Derry was very important in that and becoming increasingly important as well. So there were ships sailing back and forth. And of course, if ships are going, then people can go on them and they can start a new life on the other side of the Atlantic. Well, Derry being a natural port, and there was really just two natural ports in Ireland. You had the, the natural port down in Cork, where a lot of people who went to Australia, but Derry housed a lot of people who were interested in going to the North Americas. Derry City local historian Tony Moore. We certainly went to Philadelphia, we went to Boston, we went to New York from here, Ellis Island in New York. Ships actually sailed here, it would have taken two months to go all the way to America. So those we were quite busy here. For However, the voyage out was anything but easy. Historian Brian Mitchell. As we know now that you fly it in a few hours, but it was definitely a hazardous journey. And despite the hazards of the Atlantic crossing, nevertheless America was viewed by most emigrants as a land of endless opportunities. Alistair Morn, a tour guide with the Ulster American Folk Park, situated near Oma in County Tyrone. These people, yes, they were used to hardships. They were used to adversity. But I think the thing that really got them through a journey like this is because they were all travelling with the conviction that they were going to a better place, a place that would offer them uh, security and prosperity for them and their children, even for people who were leaving relatively comfortable surroundings here in Ireland. Such as the Pollocks, who perhaps realised they'd reached as far as they were going to get, in Irish society. But America offered people of of every background, every standing, that chance of a better life. Or at least that's what the, the popular thinking was. So what would life have been like for Robert and Magdalene Pollock, the ancestors of the future US President James Knox Pollock, once they arrived into America in about the year 1680? Historian Eddie O'Kane. Again, if you look at accounts of that period in America, you would have come across lots of references to people living in communities, in stockades and so on as well, and uh, also uneasy relationships with the various tribes who owned the land around there. Uh, You would have had a network of people whose families knew each other. Uh, Quite often you would have had referrals from the New World back to Ireland to say that there was plenty of land available, that there were various people that had uh, different successes, etc. over there. But I think that from my own reading of it, you found that quite often people were liable to paint a much rosier picture than the circumstances actually were over in America. And as was mentioned already, some time after arriving into America, the Pollock shortened their surname to Polk. Settling initially on the eastern shore of Maryland, the family later moved to south-central Pennsylvania 
then to the Carolina Hill Country, continually prospering along the way. Eddie O'Kane. They must have been uh, relatively successful in the sense that they owned some land and property, and that's shown in the wills, etc. Uh, I know that the first property that they went to uh, in Maryland, uh, which is known as Polk's Folly and so on, uh, I know that from accounts I've read, I haven't visited that area, but from accounts I've read, the land was not great land. The land initially was quite swampy land, but they seem to have made their way in the world to the extent that as time went by, they were relatively successful through the generations. And uh, the eventually James Knox Polk's family, when they moved to Tennessee, um, they, they were actually relatively successful. The father bought a house in Columbia, Tennessee, and they moved there. So they end up in Tennessee, where... I think James Knox Polk was a nine-year-old boy when the family moved into Tennessee. Brian Mitchell. And later as a young man, Paul qualified and practised as a lawyer. However, his real passion was politics. And within a few years, he became a Tennessee congressman and then subsequently a governor. Eventually, in 1844, James Knox Polk, whose ancestors came from County Donegal, was elected as the 11th President of the United States. He served as U.S. President from 1845 to 1849. So just how successful was his presidency? Dr. Daniel Geary, the Mark Pickett Professor of U.S. History at Trinity College, Dublin. Polk, and in some ways, uh, one could argue that Polk was the most uh, successful president in American history. By his own standards, I think Polk was a very successful president. He was considered to be one of the most successful presidents of America. Eddie O'Kane once again. Because it was during his presidency he actually achieved most of the goals he set himself at the start of the presidency. He increased the size of the United States territory by a third, by purchase and by treaty settlements and also by war. He acquired the British-held territory of Oregon and negotiated for its border to be located along the 49th parallel. Uh, He declared war with Mexico in 1846. In 1848, Mexico gave California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah and parts of Wyoming, Colorado and New Mexico. More than 50% of Mexican territory at the time to the US for a payment of $15 million. So that wow. was the so in other words, they, this guy really expanded the, what we now know as the contiguous U.S. United Absolutely. States. What it was under uh, Polk, who had his roots in County Donegal. Here. That's right. However, huge controversy exists as to the ethics of much of President Polk's expansionist policies, especially concerning the war which he started against Mexico to gain territory from it. Also from a purely Irish perspective, it's worth remembering that James Knox Polk was US President during the Great Irish Famine from 1845 onwards. So did he do anything to help a famine ravaged Ireland? Professor Christine Keneally, Director of the Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut, USA. From America, we know the president gave a donation. We know he gave $50, which was criticised by his political opponents. So I suppose, you know, something doesn't change. And staying with the topic of James Knox Polk's approach to Ireland during the Great Irish Famine, Dr Patrick Fitzgerald of the Mellon Centre for Migration Studies in County Tyrone had this pertinent comment to make. Another thing that's actually quite interesting to remember is that British North America, what we remember today as Canada, its record in 1847, where it really tried quite hard to redirect the flow of famine immigrants across the Atlantic towards the United States because of the concerns around disease and so forth at places like Grosse Isle. So, in a way, throughout that entire period of the famine from 1845 through into the early 50s, the ports in America did remain open to migrants who were coming across the Atlantic. Um, So that, you know, in a a very rounded way, I think, is, is something that stands to the credit of Polk and the American administration throughout that period.
and veering away from President James Knox, Paul, whose ancestors came from County Donegal. But staying with the topic of US presence with ancestral links to Ireland. Believe it or not, the ancestors of the 15th US President, James Buchanan, also came from County Donegal. Buchanan served as President from 1857 to 1861 and modern genealogical experts can trace his roots all the way back to the ancient Gaelic Ocan clan of Northwest Ireland. In the 11th century, a warrior belonged to a branch of this clan fled to Scotland, where his descendants flourished and adopted the surname Buchanan. Over half a millennium later in the 17th century, members of that same Buchanan clan returned to settle in Ulster. Historian and genealogist Brian Mitchell of the Tower Museum in Derry City. The roots back to their branch of the Acahan set, settling in the lands of Buchanan in the east of Loch Lomond in Scotland. They adopted the surname Buchanan and the 17th century came back to Ulster as planters settled in Tyrone. Uh, a Thomas Buchanan then migrated from Tyrone to Remelton about, I think about 1700. His great-grandson was then James Buchanan, who was brought up in his mum's... You know, the, James was the son of John Buchanan and Jane Russell. He was brought up in the Russell Farm, which was known as Stony Batter, outside Remelton, just three miles outside it in Donegal there. And in 1783, James was in, his uncle sent for him, uh, Joshua Russell, who owned a tavern out at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, sent for him, met him in Philadelphia. They rode, the, th- I think, the 320-mile journey on horseback out to Gettysburg. So James left here in 1783. That being James Buchanan Sr., the father of the future 15th U.S. President, also called James Buchanan, who was born in the United States in 1791. Here's local historian Leslie Buchanan from Ramelton in County Donegal to further discuss President Buchanan's ancestral links to Ramelton. His father, James Buchanan, emigrated from Ramelton in the late 18th century and uh, married a, a lady called Spear, who had Donegal connections. Elizabeth Spear. North. Elizabeth Spear, in fact, that's right. And they had, I think, quite a number of family, maybe ten. But one of them was James Buchanan, who eventually became the president. But his grandmother was Russell from one side of Remelton, country-wise, and his father was a John Buchanan from the Cairn Remelton. They got married and had several... Big, I think quite a reasonable size of a family. But James had the opportunity to go to America, sponsored by his uncle, who was a brother of his mother's. That was James, the president's father. So in turn, the president's name was James Buchanan, son of James Buchanan from Remelton. And that same James Buchanan from Mermelton, the father of the future US president, was born in the year 1761 in the old Buchanan cottage situated at High Carn, Mermelton, in County Donegal. As a young child, his mother died and his father went missing. As a result, he was brought up by his maternal Russell grandparents in the Russell homestead in a place called Stony Batter, located near Mermelton. Now at this juncture, Local historian Leslie Buchanan took me in his car to the remains of the old Buchanan cottage situated at High Carn, Remelton, where the president's father was born. Now we're driving up to the ancestral home of John Buchanan, who was the president's grandfather. He came from up here, up the, and we can go and visit, we can see his, the wall steads of his home up at the Cairn. We're just approaching, just approaching the house here now, or what was the house? So. It was a beautiful thatched house just adjacent uh, to the location here. Uh, I mean, you couldn't straight out of an uh, Irish tourist the board old postcards. Lady there that you met in the book, Sarah Buchanan, she tells me that this, these wallsteads here was the Buchanan household from John Buchanan, who was the president's grandfather. So if we take a look now, we'll, we'll see. And as you were told, and uh, as, as James Buchanan, the president, said in his memoirs, he could stand in the street and see see the water. 
which we, we, we he was, was telling the truth. We can see the Yeah, we're the looking down now and we can see the... Oh, swilly, that's right, mm-hmm. from, the, from the high cairn. That's and true. just give our listeners a word picture here now. This is where the father of the president was born, here in High Cairn, right you know, here. and his father, James, and then James, the son, becomes the president. That's right. Mm-hmm. But as, as we know, he was ra- raised at another location on the other side of town. Stony Batter. Stony Batter, that's right. So, Paul, look, see, you see these this wall steads here? This is apparently the gable end of the Buchanan household back in the 1700s. That's all remains. We know it, it has to be a building because it comes to a point here which at a right angle to this wall here so it, obviously it was a building. It wasn't just a, a wall. So it, 90 degree it, angle, 90 perfect degree 90 angle, degree. Yeah, so it's yeah. the corner mm-hmm. of a building obviously mm-hmm. when you look at it. Mm-hmm. And uh, well built to have last to this time you know when That's you think right, of it. But there, it would have yeah. been a tough uh, oh, existence a tough for existence. the people. Man. Rural <laughs> Ireland, yeah, of the day. And, you know, Th- and adjacent to this is the, uh, the cottage, the thatch cottage just to verify that that's conditions that were here at that particular time, yeah. In the year 1783, James Buchanan Sr., the father of the future 15th US President, bid farewell to his native county, Donegal, and took a ship from Derry to Philadelphia. So just how did things go for him upon his arrival into the United States? Brian Mitchell. Joshua Russell, who owned a tavern out at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, sent for him, met him in Philadelphia. They rode the, I think, the 320 mile journey on horseback out to Gettysburg. This was, so James left here in 1783. And again, it's the story of the Ulster Scots. They were restless, always on the move, always on the lookout for land. And they, so James and Buchanan in 1787 moved west to Cove Gap. He bought a trading post and named it Stony Batter after the fact of, of the home place here in Ireland. In County Donegal. In Don, Donegal. He married an Elizabeth Spear in 1788 and in 1791 the future president, James Buchanan, was born. So, I mean, that's, and that's really the story of the Ulster Scott. I mean, I think the history of early America is down to the Quakers, Germans and the Ulster Scots. And one local commentator said that the Quakers made better traders, uh, the Germans made better farmers, but the Ulster Scots were frontiersmen. They were the ones that were defending the frontier, expanding the frontier west. And as Brian Mitchell just touched on, James Buchanan Sr. rapidly prospered in America. Shortly after his son James was born in the year 1791, the Buchanans moved to a farm near Mercersburg, Pennsylvania, and later in the year 1794 moved into Mercersburg town itself. Within a short time, the future president's father became the wealthiest person in the town, as a merchant farmer and real estate investor. So why did James Buchanan Sr. prosper so rapidly in America? Kieran Fagan, manager of Monray Heritage Centre in County Donegal. It's often says when people emigrate to another world, they rapidly become successful because they're they're conditioned to think this is the land of milk and honey. If you believe that, you know, America is the best place in the world, and your your psychology is going to change when you get there. Yeah, because all of us want to confirm what we believe by action. And I think that might have been the driving force as well. This is the land of opportunity. This is the land of milk and honey. I mean, we're going to make this our own, basically. We're going to be successful. And, um, There's a fire in the belly. The fire in the belly. And I mean, they, they, they maybe saw less restrictions than that, what they were used to here. Yeah, they, maybe there was not the same type of negative influences at persecution or economic or religious or whatever. Lack of horizon. Yeah. So they really had, I would say, had this vision that this is now the new beginning. And at this juncture in my visit to Monray Heritage Centre in County Donegal, Kieran Fagan showed me their exhibition on the 15th US President, James Buchanan. 
You see the portrait of James, President James Buchanan. Uh, we have an extract here from one of his letters written in 1844. He says, My father, James Buchanan, was a native of the county of Donegal in the Kingdom of Ireland. He emigrated from that county, having sailed from Londonderry in the brig Providence, bound for Philadelphia on the 4th of July, 1783. That's an extract from his letter, so you can see he has strong Donegal roots. So James, the father, emigrated in 1783, and his son, the future president, was born in 1791 at the property in Pennsylvania that had been named Stony Batter in the memory of his family's Donegal home. Wow, so, so they never forgot the Donegal they connection. Never, they never forgot their Donegal connection. Yeah. And so, he actually visited the home routes in the 1830s, am I correct? That's, that's correct. He came back and visited his home turf. And that visit by James Buchanan to Remelton in County Donegal would have occurred in the year 1833, while he was acting US Ambassador to Russia, and several years before he became US President. Matthew Warwick, Education Officer with the Ulster Scots Agency, based in Belfast. In 1833, while travelling across Europe, Buchanan stopped off in Ireland, and one of his biographers wrote that uh, during this trip he visited the home of his ancestors at Remelton. So, you know, very much aware of his father's uh, roots. And again, Remelton is a real wee uh, Ulster Scots or Scots Irish village uh, steeped with Presbyterian history and plantation settlement going back to the early 1600s. And uh, it's nice that uh, Buchanan uh, took the time to, to visit uh, the, the shores of Loch Swilly, where his ancestors were from. James Buchanan, again, it was very clear that he knew his roots. So, in the ideal world, there's some people did know exactly where they came from. And to discover more about the island of Ireland ancestry of yet another US president, then make sure to catch our next number three programme in this seven-part Greening the White House series, when we'll be visiting the County Tyrone ancestral home of the 18th US president, Ulysses S. Grant. Until then, I'm going to leave the last word on James Buchanan, with various contributors. James Buchanan, his father, who was James Buchanan Sr., was born near Remelton in County Donegal in 1761. Buchanan, uh, President of the state of the United States, his ancestor came from here, from Remelton. James Buchanan, 15th President of the United States, who was of Donegal extraction. Another president with good, strong Ulster Scots roots. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.